Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with random reviews from the overflow room. The series that's going to go on forever. Well, no, but it's going to take us like maybe a couple of years to get through everything. And you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I really don't. I think it's kind of fun to see what the discography was in the hands of a fanatical record collector. I mean, and you seem to be enjoying this as well. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, we're on the SCHs still. Oh my God, so many SCHs. It's enough to make you crazy. Um, and I usually try and do three composers per, you know, per video. In this case, we're going to have four names. Let's put it that way. I have a big thing coming up afterwards. You know, much as I enjoy Schubert and Shostakovich and these people where we can do like 20 videos of them, because um, I have tons of it, I, I, I actually kind of like it better sometimes um, when we have a variety of things because it just goes to show what the range is. And you find interesting, interesting corners of the repertoire and people you've never heard of. And I think that's all sort of more fun for me. It's probably more fun for you. It's nice to have 15 Schubert videos. I love Schubert, but you know, I mean, you find out what recordings are out there and what we were listening to in years past, but I still think discovery is the name of the game. Um, at least if you're a hardcore collector, discovery is the name of the game. If you're new, then it's all discovery. So it's all the name of the game and that's just as good. Anyway, let's see what we have here. Florent Schmidt. Florent Schmidt. Oh, he was such a good composer. Nasty, vicious, Nazi, anti-Semite, vicious, awful, terrible person, supposedly. But, uh, you know, some people have protested that. There's a Florent Schmidt revisionist crew out there that are saying he was actually just, you know, um, a sweet, dulcet, delicious little personality, a butterfly among men, and I don't know. Anyway, uh, I don't care. I care about his music. Music is really fun. It's dense. It's noty. It's, 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 you know, sort of rugged, post-dandy fun. It is. It's fun. It's just fun. It's heavy, though. It's not, you know, you think French, you'll, you think, you know, lighter things, airy things, puffy things, croissants and marmalade, you know. Well, there's also cassoulet, you know, stuff that really sits, sits there. And uh, this, this sits there, but sits there, I, I think, very entertainingly. And this, one of the great all-time Schmidt records, it was the only one you could get for decades. It was Jean Martinon doing his La Tragédie de Salomé, this wonderful tone poem thing. It's just fabulous. Um, and it was a ballet, then it became a tone poem. And the Psalm 47, which is just, you know, it's, it's praise God with cymbals and noise-making instruments, and boy, does this make noise. It's phenomenal. And it, like I said, it's with Jean Martinon and the Orchestre National de l'ORTF. And it was always great, and it was the only show in town. This coupling has been repeated many times since, but this is still, still the one. Um, so that's good. This is the Japanese. I always got like the Japanese one because it was out of print for like forever. It was really annoying. I mean, it wasn't even available on CD for a long time. It just was was really depressing. Then we've got these two Marco Polo, um, Florent Schmidt things. We have the complete ballet, the tragedy of Salome. Um, the first version from 1907, which is really fun. I mean, it's written for a chamber ensemble. This is with the uh, Staatsphilharmonie Rhineland Falls under Patrick Davin. Uh, it's very well recorded. It's really a nice disc. And this one too, orchestral works, the Danse d'Abissag and Habi, oh my goodness, Abeyse. It's H-A-B-E-Y-S-S-E, -S -S -E, accent aigu E. Abeyse. Suite for Violin and Orchestra, and Rev Dreams, and his Symphony Number no. 2, which is actually quite concise. It's only three, three movements, and they last about 24 minutes, which is not bad. This is the same orchestra under Life Segerstam. So that's a bit of a novelty. And then we have another sort of an updated modern version of the Tragedy of Salome and the Psalm um, 47, and also the Sweet Sons Esprit de Suite. The sweet without the spirit of a sweet, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's odd. Or without the spirit of sweet, sweetness, sweetosity, whatever a sweet is. 
uh, with the BBC National Orchestra and Chorus of Wales under Thierry Fisher on Hyperion. This was one of the few discs that was kind of competitive, sort of, kind of, with the uh, Martignon, which is still the best. And that's Florent Schmidt. So once you deal with Florent Schmidt, uh, the Schmidt with the two T's, you have Schmidt's with T's, with DT, the DT Schmidt's, and there are a lot of those, but the only one that we really care about is Franz. And I only have a couple of Franz Schmidt's down here in the overflow room, because most of it is upstairs with the main collection, but there are two really, really good discs. This is phenomenally successful. Symphony Number no. 4, his most famous symphony, and the orchestral music from his opera Notre Dame with the, Never with the Netherlands Philharmonic under Jakob Kreitzberg. This was really, really good. I mean, it's, it's on pentatone, if it's still available at all, probably not, um, but it was a very good performance and I enjoyed it considerably. But then there was the recording of the fourth, the one that we all learned it from, Zubin made it in the Vienna Phil. Um, it's a coupling year to Mahler's second symphony. Now, Franz Schmidt was the principal cello in the Vienna Philharmonic under Mahler, and supposedly his, his uh, you know, fans are telling us he was, Mahler didn't treat him very nicely, and it was all very unpleasant and whatnot, but, you know, who the hell knows. Anyway, um, Schmidt has his, his little group of, of people who really swear by him, particularly his apocalyptic oratorio, The Book of the Seven Seals. Which I always call the Book of the Seven Veils, but that's that's another story, isn't it? Um, and he's a very good composer, and he wrote a lot of music, that some of which is really quite fine. So there's that, and then we're going way back a few hundred years to to Johann Heinrich Schmelzer. Now Schmelzer, Schmelzer was one of those guys who was in the same crew as Bieber, you know, Bieber and and, and that guy, you know, Bieber who wrote all those violin sonatas and, and, and the early German Baroqueists. I mean, his dates were 1620 to 1680, circa. No one's quite sure. Um, and there are two discs here, which are rather fun. You've got uh, Tafel Musique under Jean Lamont, and, his, and this one is with Romanesca on Harmonia Mundi. I mean, he wrote, this, uh, there's this wonderful sonata, The Victory of the Christians Over the Turks. I mean, they did these programmatic things that were lots of fun. You know, Bieber's Battaglia, for example. Well, that's in that tradition. Um, then we've got his sonatas from Sonate Unarum Fidium of 1664, a bunch of those. And Romanesca, by the way, is Andrew Mancy before he started conducting modern stuff. Nigel North and John Toll. That's a very good lineup, isn't it? And here we have some more sonatas and his Chacon in three for three choirs. Um, on, this is all period instrument stuff too. Uh, Lamento Sopra la Morte Ferdinandi the uh, Third, and oh good lord, there's all kinds of stuff in here. So, the Balletti Francesi, oh, from the opera by Antonio Sesti, Nettuno e Flora Festeggiante, which is Neptune and Flora, you know, have a party basically. Um, and these are all like dances and sonata thingies in various parts. And like, if you like Bieber, you're going to like Schmelzer because he was one of that crowd. And last but not least, let me see, where does this go? This goes here under, under Schmidt. But now we're in the S-C-H-M-E's. There is the art of Tito Schipa. Tito Schipa, the great, the great operatic, whatever he was. He was a baritone. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so, oh, good Lord. No, he's a tenor. What am I saying? A Neapolitan song. And this is, this is all old, 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 old stuff. Tito Schiba wasn't a baritone. What am I doing? Oh, my goodness. I'm just a fool, aren't I? So here we have, uh, well, it could have been a, what is this? I don't know. It was on Nimbus. Remember they were doing all these, these, these Nimbus acoustic horn things. He lived from 1888 to 1965. And uh, there's just tons of music here. Lots and lots and lots of music. That's all we need to know. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me now. I, don't even, I, I was never one of these historical opera voice people. Somehow this crept into my collection. I guess I'm glad it did. I mean, I did listen to it. I did. And I don't really have any desire ever to listen to it again. So, I'm sorry. 
if I've let down the opera people. But then again, I've been letting them down for years, so it hardly matters. Keep on listening. Take care.